Okay, hopefully a little shorter than that. Yeah, I won't last eight. Okay, I'm just <laughs> going to see if we are live on the thing. Well, it says live for me, so I think this is probably... Oh, yeah, okay, there you go. All right, I can see myself. All right, well, uh, welcome, Kurash, uh, to another episode of Crypto Mushroom uh, Podcast. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's great to be able to just talk to lots of you know great traders that I've been connecting with on, on Twitter, and um, yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome here. Um, I was thinking maybe you could give us a quick introduction. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. I think podcasts are really awesome. They're a great way to put out content. Uh, the audio side of content in most spaces is coming up a lot. Like the number of people listening to podcasts is going through the roof. So yeah, thanks for having me be a part of it. And yeah, my name's Cool Rush. Uh, I have a pretty large Twitter following, which is probably what I am on this podcast right now. I am a trader, an entrepreneur. I studied maths at university and that's pretty much what my bio is. I try to put out a lot of educational content and also I go on to the motivational side as well. I feel getting the right mindset out there is just as important as giving people the right information because, well, the information's like ammo and then the mindsets, the ability to pull the trigger, like they're both useless without each other. The two go hand in hand. Uh, so yeah, that's who I am. And my intro is I'll talk a bit about how I got in. Uh, I started late 2016, where I saw this really cool cryptocurrency thing. And initially, it just looked as a very volatile asset. And as an entrepreneur, I'm always looking for opportunities. Cryptocurrency was just this amazing money making opportunity I saw. Um, I wasn't really too fast on the tech and stuff. And obviously, I went down the same rabbit hole most people go down. Um, oh, wow, this is the new internet. This is going to change everything. Um, this is like buying Google when it just came out. Uh, all those phases which people normally go through. Uh, but actually, one key thing was I had information about the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance a little bit before it was getting out to the masses. So I managed to get a good bunch of Ethereum and that also made me feel like a genius. So I had a roller coaster of a ride in 2017, just up and down, immense amounts of money, uh, thinking I knew what I was doing. Thankfully, it all worked out for me because I actually think I would have made a lot less money if I knew how to trade, which is a funny thing to say, but those were the, one of the like the best market conditions to not know how to trade. As long as you somewhat learned how to trade, towards the ends. So initially the recklessness paid off and as my trading knowledge grew, my risk came down and my reward became more consistent, which is quite lucky. And yeah, I think a key thing which helped me was a mathematical background with being able to trade because I had a good understanding of data, manipulating data, and of course probability and that mindset it's essential to trading. It really, really helps to just see them all as um, it's literally just data. If you understand how data, data works, how sample sizes work, how data can be manipulated, it just, uh, the whole thing makes a lot more sense. Uh, yeah, that's my intro. No, I think uh, makes a lot of sense what you're saying, uh, especially about like how everything is just data because uh, it's kind of like coming from a poker background. I definitely mm -hmm. feel like uh, sometimes traders uh, or, you know, people who are not um, yet profitable and they're still trying to get into it, they have a slightly different way of thinking of, of everything. Whereas I think of everything in a certain, you know, risk reward ratio. How much am I investing? What is the reward? And what is uh, the potential um, loss? Focus. Such a fantastic analogy because people, a lot of people, they, they, in my opinion, there is no right and wrong trade based just on uh, whether you've won or lost. Whether you win or lose doesn't actually change what you should have done. And a lot of people will say, I won this trade, I lost this trade. I've probably used that terminology myself. But what you need to realize is if you have a system which works, for example, if you get a really good hand in poker, 
you have double aces and you, um, again, I'm not a poker expert, so let me know if I say anything silly, but um, I'm pretty sure um, bullets are a good opening hand. And if you have double aces, uh, you, you can play aggressively, especially if you've got a good place on the table. But you could still lose to someone who has one of the worst hands. And I think that's like five or something like that. It's like, like 80%. Five, six, you get a full house and, right, yeah. right. So you have an 80% chance of winning. But you, and if you play aggressively and lose, that doesn't mean the next time you get double aces, you shouldn't play aggressively or lose. You did the wrong thing. Uh, so the important thing to do after a trade, whatever the result, whether a win or loss, is to go back and see whether or not you, given that exact same data, would have made the same decision again. And once this happens over and over again, unlike poker, we don't have exact percentages, so we need to make our own. We go back and adjust that and make it more and more profitable. So, and if you know over a set of, say, 100 trades that that works, then taking a stop loss sensibly is a win. Taking your profit sensibly is a win also. Tell you what isn't a win. Not hitting your profit target and making more, that's a loss to me because that's not what my data tells me to do. So I have lost if I got greedy and I have more because over the long game, that'll make me lose. Same with taking your loss too late or too early. As long as it's sticking to your data, that's the only win. Anything more or less than that, regardless of outcome, I see as a loss. No, totally, man. I, and I think it's uh, really refreshing for me to kind of uh, you know listen to you talk about it, especially considering you don't come from a poker background, because in poker, it is exactly like that. Like you can make the right decision, but still lose but, but a lot of people are very results orientated, which is also the reason that you see a lot of newbies, uh, if they're following someone on trading view or they're, you know, they're, they're looking at some guru or uh, some professional trader and then the trader is wrong in, the, in some trades, yeah. they'll be like, oh, he's not very good. They, they'll assume he's not very good because they won't really understand how that kind of stuff works, right? Oh, my, I can't like <laughs> agree with that enough. It's, it's um, I, if you've seen my tweets, uh, people are probably sick of hearing me say, don't follow this, make your own system, do not follow this blindly, because uh, the reason I put out my content isn't so people buy, like uh, recently I posted a very just general analysis of Bitcoin stating around 3K to 1.7K, that entire range being a support zone, an area where bounces are likely to happen. Now, I personally will zoom in when the price enters there and look for scalp plays, but a lot of people think I'm saying buy here, and hope not all reason I have information out is you guys so people can see how my mind works, get hints in the system and develop their own from it. Uh, if you don't have your own data, that doesn't matter what book you read, doesn't matter the person you're following, how many times it's previously worked, you, you need to make your own system that has its own data. Yeah, that's People will, but the traders, I don't know a single person who's ever gotten rich showing other people's signals. Uh, if you do, let me know right now, but I've never spoken to a trader who made his fortune or is making his living following someone else's signals. Never. Not give me one case of that and I'll be a little bit swayed, but generally everyone who follows signals will initially do maybe initially do well if they're lucky and over the long run they'll lose money because they don't understand risk management their psychology isn't in check and boy psychology that's a huge one which is also often overlooked again going back to the poker example uh if you're on a winning streak i imagine you get really cocky you get um you start thinking that you can read everyone on the a table, you're, you're the psychic genius. Uh, same with trading. If you win a few trades in a row, a lot of trades in a row, that's the worst. That's the time you are most vulnerable and you'll go all in and lose a bunch of money. Uh, yeah, that's happened to me as well. I'm still cautious of it happening to me. If any time my mindset isn't in place, if any time I have, say, say for me, a personal weakness is if I'm hungry, I do not trade well. Like I'm one of the worst people when it comes to hanger. So Wow, that's every, interesting. Almost, yeah, yeah. Almost every mistake I've had hugely uh comes down to hunger with trade like hunger's been involved with almost all my trading and mistake. Huge stupid stuff because uh well your brain isn't functioning at full capacity or emotional regulation goes down. Uh 
the brain functions on carbohydrates. It, uh, you need hormonal regulation, uh, essential fatty acids that are a huge part of that. Uh, insulin control, which can affect mood. Protein really helps with that, having like enough protein in your diet. Uh, so all these things interlink hugely. Trading, it's just a lifestyle. Oh, there's so many things to balance out. Um, no, yeah. for sure, for sure. I had, uh, you know, you're reminding me of this one time where I was like, um, recently I was not doing well trading and and I woke up uh, the next day and I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm gonna look at the charts today. I'll, I'll try and make it, you know, be mm -hmm. productive and stuff. And I went for, but I was still in a bad mindset from the day before and from the weeks before. And um, I went for a coffee and it's insane what happened. I came back, jacked up on caffeine and I started, you know, looking for trades. I got into a trade yeah. and it didn't work. Then I flip flopped on the trade and I, I, I just like had a series of bad trades and I was also breaking all kinds of rules that I had in place uh, about position uh. size and risk management. And it was really weird because I had talked to myself the day before and said, okay, dude, just manage your risk, manage your position sizes. It's not that difficult yeah. and you should be fine. And I was like, all right, all right. You know, how difficult is it? It's not that hard uh, thinking about it in, the, in, in that sense, but something happened. I was in a certain emotional state and then the caffeine on top of that, making me even more Caffeine's impulsive, <laughs> even more impulsive. Yeah. And I, then I, I, it dawned on me after I'd just lost, you know, and I was like, what the fuck just happened? And it really, we are such slaves to our hormonal system. It is insane. Really. You know, we can go from, you know, not focusing on things, uh, things that distract us and we're being productive. Next minute, you know, you know, you are thinking about girls, your testosterone is a little bit higher. Thinking about girls, you want to go out, you want to, you know, it's just really insane how, how much of a slave Absolutely. we are to our hormonal levels. Yeah. We're animals at the end of the day. We are, and in fact, the way our brain works is uh, the logic part of our brain does everything it can to keep the emotional part of our brain happy. Most people think, uh, especially people who uh, see themselves as more intellectual, think their logical brain is in control of their emotional side. It's always the other way around. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're logical, you tend to have a bit more awareness of what the emotional side is. And uh, anyone who follows me on Twitter will be pretty sure that I was gonna talk about meditation at some point, if not a lot during this. And meditation's the answer. Do you meditate? Is absolutely the answer. Oh, hugely. I think it's one of the keys to my trading success, my success in business, uh, the, how I'm able to maintain a high work ethic, a structured routine. It helps with everything. And it's not what most people think. A lot of people think if you meditate, you become a Zen monk who feels nothing and can manipulate matter and their brains and stuff like that. But that's not what it is at all. In fact, it's so much more subtle and simple. Uh, all it does is make you more aware. So it doesn't make me not emotional when I'm hungry. It doesn't make me uh, suddenly in control of that. It just makes me aware of that so I know to eat. It's, it's such a simple little thing. It makes me aware that there's caffeine in my system, making me adrenaline up, and that's what's causing me to do that. And then it also develops the willpower to do something about that. You still feel everything you feel. You're not going to get rid of that. There's no human I've process tried, that can do I've that. I've tried to meditate a few times, and I get into it. I get into it. And um, by the way, I really should because I heard that it also mm -hmm. your front cortex or something also gets more like your brain starts to develop itself more. They've seen studies, right, where if you meditate for like X amount of months, people have started to like uh, regrow parts of their brain, which – I probably need because you know I do drink Absolutely. too much alcohol. So, <laughs> well, it develops gray matter. Um, it, it's scientifically pro proven, develops gray matter, and also it helps connectivity between different parts of the brain. Um, and uh, I'm not sure you picked up. Uh, I'll, I can find the study and link it for the podcast after. But it improves connectivity, and you can see that with brain scans, seeing how different parts of the brain send signals to each other uh, immensely. If It's like a chart where you see one side, which is not so colorful going between, and the other, which is a lot more colorful. Again, that's not super scientific, but it, it seemed like a decent study. The, the most substantial one is the one showing the increase in brain matter, brain matter, because that's very unobjectively measured. You can't really 
fake those results because mm -hmm. obviously you've got to be careful with data with studies because as someone who understands data as someone who studied statistics it's so easy to manipulate you can make any study say anything you want as you just focus on the data you care about and even in, in from one set of data depending on what you look at you can look at the um, smaller range you can include anomalies you can um, focus on the average you can use so many different things to just make the data say whatever you want to say so again studies can be very manipulated but uh, something like the actual amount of gray matter brain that's a lot harder to manipulate which is why <laughs> a study like that is better uh, but yeah you spoke about trying to get into meditation well yeah, it's hard for me been... like i've tried to, i've tried like for a couple of days uh usually what happens to me is i'll try for a couple of days i'll have the the headspace yeah. right and it'll remind me like okay i'll do it and then i'm guessing that because there's no uh like dopamine reward for me so after a couple of days of doing it i don't get that kind of reward maybe and that's why i'm you know if i'm going to self-analyze and then i just kind of forget about it well that time you know, recently when you went trading and you messed up you lost the money did, how did you feel after that like shit like 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 shit exactly um it for me what drives me is the that i was so stupid if i was not to insult you at all but i've been there i've done stupid stuff like that like after one time after i had an argument with someone um that affected me mentally i went to trade and i I'm not kidding. I went all in my entire trading portfolio on a range. Literally, the price was ranging, and I was like, oh, this is even going to go up or down a few percent, and I'm just doing this right now just because I was so mentally out of it. And regardless of how much I meditated, regardless of everything I had in place, that one time I slipped, and it happens. It happens to everyone. I don't care how um, zen you are, how many years you've met, um, traded, how much experience you have. Our emotions are always there. And it's foolish to underestimate them. Right, right. To whatever you can measures to never do that again. Uh, but again, for me, that a situation like that is what motivates me to continue to meditate. Um, and the initial step is the hardest. So um, a, a book I love, it's called The Mind Illuminated. I highly recommend you read it if you care at all about meditation. It's uh, written, it combines brain science with meditation. So it's not like a wishy-washy book it's literally like it lays out an eight stage book the first stage is the hardest by far the first stage is do it do it every day routinely doesn't matter what technique you're this using, book is about what meditation you're like uh because of what sorry this book is is about like how to get started with meditation you said it's like an eight step thing so it's an eight step thing not to get started to go from beginner to master oh, to literally get it, so it starts off by getting you, and the entire thing, the eight stages, are to cultivate cultivate two things, awareness and attention. Awareness lets you know what's going on. It doesn't control the emotions. It just lets you be aware of them, which is huge. Most people, uh, well, you've heard the phrase blackout angry. So so when someone just, everything blacks out and they wake up and they're just like, what did I do out of anger? They beat someone up. That is the, like, the extremity of lack of self-awareness to the emotions um, taking over. On a more micro level, that's what happened when you had your caffeine, when you got your adrenaline rush. I I'm sure that you looking back was like, what the hell was he doing? But now you're like, um, well, it's so obvious well, that that's what was happening. Well, it's mm. about in that moment being able to have that awareness. And then when, when it comes to attention, that is the willpower, the not getting, the not procrastinating, which I remember you mentioned. Uh, I can, focus on studying trading for say two hours and that's how much i can give attention then i need to like recharge my willpower reserves and it's actually a resource which we have willpower it's not unlimited uh anything we do which we yeah, don't I've heard really that before. Want to do trains that willpower oh uh, yeah absolutely and meditation is one way of increasing that willpower reserve that's why um so one thing if you the best way to tell if I've been extremely busy is if my room gets messy. Because I love keeping my room tidy um, because I'm very, uh, you can tell, I'm, I'm structural. I like everything in place. I like everything a certain way. But when I have an intense work schedule, when I'm trading heavily, when um, there's a lot of stuff going on with my businesses, I take 
any task which requires willpower and remove it. I don't cook food, I order it. I don't tidy my room because the first thing I do when I wake up is get on with the tasks I need to do. And again, if you're conscious of this will that you have a limited supply, it's it can vastly improve your productivity. Right, right, right. No, for sure. Um, I definitely need to get on back on that. Um, something else that I kind of want to go back a little bit to is talking about yes. developing your own system because I really, really agree mm -hmm. with you wholeheartedly about like this kind of thing where people try and copy trades. I mean, I understand copying trading, but everyone really needs to you know, build their own system and understanding of the markets, in my opinion, even if you like my view is that even if you are only a Bitcoin investor, I really think yeah. that um, you need to educate yourself and understand the market. So you don't have to do you don't have to learn margin trading, but you will know next time you, you're in on some kind of uh, coin or whatever it is, you know, when to take profits, et cetera, et cetera, and have an understanding of when are we having trend reversals, et cetera, you know. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I'm going to break that down into a few parts. Uh, first of all, before you go into trading, you need to understand investing. Secondly, before you get seriously into investing, you need to understand a little bit about trading. Uh, the two work in harmony fantastically. So firstly, why do you need to know a little bit about tra trading and investing? This is the shorter answer. I'll start here. So literally take, for anyone who's just an investor, take two moving averages, a big one and a small one. It doesn't need to be anything in particular. And every time they cross over and they're going up, the trend is upwards. Every time they cross over and they're going down, the trend has changed to go downwards. That, that, that's it. You've already increased your understanding what's going on with the market hugely. How is that information going to be anything but helpful? Uh, the more you can get, the better. But get these very... It doesn't even have to be acted upon. Uh, it just gives you a knowledge and understanding of what's going to give you emotional. Uh, it can give you a lot of emotional stability when you have some idea what's going on with the price data and you have some confidence in your ability to read this. So absolutely learn the basics. Literally, you mentioned trends, moving averages. Pick two and you already know what direction the market's going in. Oh, one more. If they're crisscrossing, it means it's going sideways. Uh, there you go. So now let's go to the other one, and this one is huge. So first I'll talk about why you need to know if you're going into trading. And secondly, I'll go into the actual system development and the specifics to do with that. So why do you need to know about investing if you're going trading? Well, let's zoom out of trading. Any income building skill you have, you need to understand what to do with your money. What's the, like, what's the point of getting money, Ian? If Years. I think that's yeah, you're, you're cutting out one second. One second. Is, am I back? I think yeah, you're, you're good. Yeah, I lost we'll you for a second. Okay, yeah, go on. Sorry. Uh, I, I lost you for a second. You just, you just cut out for me. I couldn't even see anything. Oh, it was, it was, um, where did you lose me? Anyone else lost me? Thai internet is so shit. I got a 100 megabit connection. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, uh, let me make sure. No, no, no. I, I lost you at I lost you at um, uh, when you said um, investing, and uh, you were talking about how you, what you need to do. You need to know what to do with your money. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So if you have money coming in and you don't know what to do with your money, then you are at a catastrophic risk. Uh, the, the majority. The reason most people never retire rich is because they don't have the understandings of the basics of money. I honestly think people earning the average salary, most of them could retire with a million. That, that sounds that sounds crazy, but most of them could. They just had a small, small understanding of money management. Uh, what most people do is, one, they spend ridiculous amounts of money, which they, they it doesn't seem ridiculous to them because everyone around them is doing it, but it is a ridiculous amount of money. You, you take away your, you're, you're losing employees because your money is like your own employees, which will generate you more money. Uh, and the other thing they do is in a bank. So not only they not use that, they're, they're throwing away their employees, giving them away to other people, but they're not using the employees they currently have and letting them like get old and lose their productivity. And that is the 3% interest rate at banks in 40 years, your money halves. It's just how many people do you know who have their life savings just sitting in a bank account? Yeah. Like 
whittling away. When if you take 500 pounds, 500 pounds a month, and put it into a super broad index fund, and it does the same average as for stocks, that is, and it does the same average that it's done for the past 140 years, uh, that's like seven to eight percent. On average, it takes 34 years to reach a million. How many people do you know who could afford to put in 500 pounds a month, have a couple less beers after work, have um, just one one week, which they were going to go out to the club, they don't, and they just put that aside, uh, spend a little bit less money on food out, and just, there you go, you have a million guaranteed for when you're, not guaranteed, obviously, but um, you have like a lot more money than you would have otherwise had just by having an understanding of these basics. And there's even more stuff you can understand, uh, like uh, risk, how exposure works with in regards to your wealth, because wealth itself is extremely fickle. Uh, cash is not reliable. Stocks on their own are not reliable. You really need to spread that risk and make sure you're safe. So that's why anyone with an income, let alone trading, which is uh, extremely risky and you need to know what to do with your money coming in so you can give yourself a cushion, if you will, to protect you. Uh, that's why you need to know about investing if you're trading, absolutely. And now to go on into the second part, the actual system. Well, developing a trading system is done incorrectly, I feel, by a lot of people. So there's two categories with regards to this. Uh, number one, it's you get you, you have the swing traders and then you have the more low tie frame scalpers. Um, th this is how I personally see it. So with swing traders, it's a little bit more difficult to isolate the specifics of a system to get an exact checklist of everything you want. And that's why I personally am not the biggest fan of swing trading. I've only been able to come up with one system which works pretty well for me that has exact checklists which I can tick off and it'll be the same every time because to have consistent data, you need to have exact checklists. So to develop a system, the way it is don't implement anything until I have an exact checklist, which I've tested. Now I'm excessive. I like to have a thousand back tests and a hundred real time trust tests before I apply anything. And that's again, because I have an intuitive understanding of data. I know how bad a sample size of 20 or 50 trades is. That's not realistic because most people don't have the patience for that. And I understand that that's, it's not fun. No one wants to not go in off, off a sample. No one wants to wait a hundred trades before they actually start using real money. Uh, but yeah, so with regards to developing the system, one, you need a lot of data and two, to make that data reliable, you need specific checklists. So for my scalping strategies, I have exact pinpoint things I look for. I take into account the number of confluent arguments coming in. I take into account um, a lot of data, but it's all calculable. I can literally get off. I feel like you, you need to be like a pilot. Um, you, you, you have little routines you need to do. And only once everything is done, once everything is safe, you enter the position. Um, unlike what, pilot, kind of, what kind of stuff do you have on your checklist? Like, can you give some examples? Um, uh, yeah, sure. So it can be moving averages, um, doing certain things, RSI levels, hitting certain things. A lot of people don't like RSI, but uh, actually, this is a great part. It doesn't matter what I have on mine. So I use uh, RSI, I use moving averages, I use um, relative size of candles to each other, um, wicks going to certain areas, a lot of things. But it doesn't matter whatever way, if hugely comes into it. But are there trigger points? I don't even like mentioning them too much because a lot of people don't. A lot of people just find them silly, which to me is silly because it doesn't matter what indicator you're using, it doesn't matter what strategy you're using. If you use price action, clouds, um, Elliott Wave, whatever you want, the only thing that matters is the data you have backing it. Any system is as good as the data behind it. So for example, if you want to make a system out of Elliott Waves and you want to make a specific checklist, here's what you do. So you set your conditions for a wave one, then isolate. So are you familiar with Elliott Wave at all? Yes, yes. Awesome. For those who aren't, there's a five wave structure which goes up. And what I'm talking about is a lot of people will try to trade the wave one up, the wave two down, the wave three up again, the wave four down, the wave five, or multiple parts of it. That's not a system. That's a vague understanding of a TA concept, which will let you draw pretty, pretty charts, but not actually trade. 
So what you want to do is say, I'm looking to trade wave threes. You identify your conditions for a wave one and two, and then you specifically look for the exact same setup for that wave three every time. Now you can add arguments into this. For example, I mentioned moving averages. You can say, I'm looking for a confluent trend as well. So you want a trend, which is also going up with it. You can also say, yeah, so as in like a resistance, I want there to be a confluent resistance with the wave two bounce point. And this is how you make your system better. Start with a basic isolated concept and look for the same thing every time. Don't try to trade the impulse wave up, the corrective waves, um, even every part of one type of wave. Literally isolate one thing, make that a system. And then if you want to trade another part of the wave, make another system for it. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> what I say with cross systems. No, that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, and you use uh, mostly you, you'll do like uh, moving average and RSI. And and uh, what about like price action? Or you use do you use? Uh, there's yeah. a there's a big so, trend right now on uh, crypto Twitter, right? Using order blocks and uh, stuff like that. So I don't specifically actually use price action the way other people do it. Um, I've set higher time range, low, like a high low, a central point, and then they look for blocks within that. That's not really what I do. I Again, this comes from my understanding of the data. I use support and resistance zones, which is just what I call it, when I see a large body of candles. And what do those candles represent? Again, this is why people need to understand data. That's There's a lot of, there's a lot of disagreement with people in that area. There's a lot of volume. Um, yeah, the yeah, volume, not necessarily. Sometimes the price goes up and down without there being a lot of trading volume. Uh, that's fair, right? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. But yeah, generally, what I see is if a lot of people are disagreeing with the price. If no one thinks the price should go up or down, then that is an area of contention. That is an area where people don't know what's going to happen. So we need to, in those areas, expect a similar thing to happen again. Now, confluence would be volume. So if there's volume as well, that means there was a lot of people participating in the market agreeing that there was um, disagreement almost. So that's the way I see it, just from understanding of data. I haven't actually studied order blocks or um, any form of act like you know, um, the way those price action traders trade. I feel that they they um, come from the same source, whatever that source is. I haven't actually gone into it. I just understand from data what areas of contention are and any area of debate or support or resistance. Yeah, that's pretty much what I actually try to do as well because I yep. was doing a lot of, um, you know, some months ago I started learning more about those uh, order block concepts uh, through a trader main yeah. Discord, right? And um, then I realized, like, you know, you can just look at the price and you can just see how price is reacting to, reacting to certain levels and draw that out and it'll be pretty much the same thing. You don't have to focus that much on exactly uh, you know certain order blocks, but obviously higher time frame levels where price is reacting is always going to be stronger than lower time frames, etc. Um, but Absolutely. yeah, it's kind of funny how how we all use these different indicators, but we're actually it's just a uh, a reflection of really what where what price is doing at different levels. Every strategy, every indicator, it's all just support and resistance. Everyone is just looking for areas of support and resistance. Mm. Doesn't matter what you call yourself. You, you identify something as an area of support or resistance, and you make a play on it. That's what everyone does. That's what everything is, is at its core. And you can see a lot of similarities between different types of trading. For example, um, a lot of popular price pattern, like chart patterns for like the classical charts, they can be very easily expressed in Elliott Wave. So um, almost exact number of touches they look for. So like a head and shoulders pattern, you can literally draw an impulse wave up, a corrective wave down, and then another impulse wave up. It's, uh, you can put them all down. They're all the same. They're all very similar. Uh, everyone's just looking for support and resistance. And you'll find that a lot of the best systems tend to do very similar stuff in slightly different ways. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. So I absolutely agree with that. No, no, for sure. I, I've, I've found that myself as well. Sometimes um, recently I had a friend of mine, he likes to do Elliott Wave, uh, yeah. uh, Elliott Waves. And, you know, I was like, oh, you, you got the same trade idea that I did, but just in a different way, you know, so that was it happens fun. all the time. It happens all the time. No, uh, yeah, go on. 
Yeah, I was going to say, uh, so that's kind of contradictory almost because a big thing is when you see a lot of consensus on the same thing happening, almost exclude one of the best indicators. And like I said, you need systems, but one thing you can rely on quite heavily is if everyone, everyone on Twitter says the same thing's going to happen, it never does. It never does, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it never does, ever. Do you, do you um, put and, a lot of weight into sentiment when you in your trading? So I don't put any weight in of sentiment into my trading. I literally, I like I said, I'm a, I'm, I may as well be a bot. There's slight things I, so I actually run a lot of bots myself. But certain systems, it's hard to automate one because it, the laddering and spreading of the trades becomes very difficult, and there's a lot of room for error. And another reason is because. As I'm looking for confluence, there's just sometimes there's too many variables with the system, so I prefer to execute them manually. But the simpler ones, bots are great for it. And yeah, I went a bit off topic, but yeah. So I am a robot when it comes to trading. I stick to the system very regularly. I zone out all. I can be in gold, corn, silver, um, waves, MDA, uh, some company I've never heard of. Doesn't matter what it is that I'm trading. I treat it exactly the same. I'm just looking at the price data and the trade data and making my decisions off of that. I deliberately ignore and any other noise which is going to take me away from my proven system because anything which can't be accounted for within my data is noise. Even though it might be valid in determining direction of price, if I haven't tested for it, it's just going to distract me and make me do emotional things. Uh, so, no, I don't, but at the same time, I've just noticed the strong trend with it. Uh, every time someone's, everyone's agreed on a level that there's going to be a bounce, like when we first dropped from 6K, every single person said we're going back up to retest 6K before going back down. Everyone on Twitter exclusively, mm -hmm. um, like I, I can't remember a single account that didn't say something like that's going to happen, and we didn't even get close to it. We just, we've just been coming straight down. Uh, non-stop so yeah Twitter consensus is huge I don't use it but I definitely noticed that whenever someone agrees everyone agrees on something it's probably so not what about happen. what about now because I feel like everyone's saying that 3k should be the bottom etc so what are your thoughts on that then I've noticed that as well everyone's saying it and we're going price, to 1k guys to price later, now sense. we know <laughs> man um you know, you joke, and this was a joke for a while, but the sad thing is it's pretty close to a reality right now. I know, um, it's crazy. I, at... I mean, I mean, when we were coming, uh, we were at 6K, everyone, <laughs> no one thought we were going to go to 4K. In fact, when we were at 8 or 9K, no one thought we were going to go to 6K. Then we were at 6K, no one thought we were going to go below 6K. And, you know... Before, like people were dreaming of buying Bitcoin below 10K, and now here we are at free, like free K, and everyone's scared of it. I mean, that's I guess that's how the markets work. But this is when the real capitulation is happening. Like right now, you can see it on Twitter. People are even the OGs, the older accounts. Everyone's just backing out. People are starting new businesses. People are moving away from crypto. This is the real like money leaving crypto this is these are the levels where the real stress comes in people it was all e it was really easy to say oh i'm i'm a hodler i'm super strong i'm stoic i'm sticking to my systems when it was at 10k 6k but now when sub 1k is a reality uh when people who bought at 20k are like just imagine i've oh man you should see the amount of money some people have lost it's uh people lost my education they Bought in up, people have lost money. Uh, life savings. One guy who was a waiter had worked 12 years, saved up like 200k, and all of it bought in at the top, and now he's left with like 8k. Oh, Jesus Christ! So it's horrible. But that's you, why that's why this, these people need to educate themselves. It's not just about following signals. It's not just about. Yeah. I don't want. I don't want people to, to just. You know, I don't want people to just buy Bitcoin now. Like when people ask me now, should I get Bitcoin? I'll be like, yeah, around these areas, these prices where you want to start getting in. But people, in my opinion, they really need to educate themselves and how markets work so they can navigate. It's not you can't do this get rich thing and just buy Bitcoin and then, you know, cash out at some point because no one, no one, no one cashed out. Right. Like all the people that I know 
Yeah. All my poker yeah. player friends, they lost like 75% of their, uh, their, um, you know, pretty much their bankrolls, their, their, all their money because of the fact that they kept buying and they put more and more into crypto. And now it's, you know, now it's just, um, uh, gone, <laughs> gone down so much. Uh, so if you don't know how to cash out and so let me give, use myself an example here as, as the price was going up, uh, one of the hardest things that I was doing was actually cashing out because because I was in 2016. I, I went through a roller coaster, and you have no idea how difficult it was to stick to my system of taking out 20% um, every time the price went up 20%, regardless of what happened. And I felt like such an idiot because there's a big psychological ish um, a psychological thing which comes into play, and it's called uh, like the rich neighbor. And uh, some of the smartest people in the world have fallen for this. It's when your friend who's less intelligent than you, you may not be, but is perceived by you to be less intelligent than you, is making a lot of money doing something stupid. You get jealous. You feel stupid for not making that much money and you, you want to jump it. So uh, the, I was a victim of this. And while I stuck to my system for my core portfolio, uh, my friend was making a lot of money off ICOs. Like, disgusting amount of money off ICOs. And finally I caved in. I was like, okay, I've had enough of this. I'm done with being sensible and sticking to my system. Um, ICX, that sounds like a good thing to get in on ICO. And I put a stupid amount of money into it. And like, it, so uh, it, it, it sucks, but- Well, that went up a lot. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like it 40X or something, right? But you were cashing out at 2X or 3X or what? Oh, so that this ICX was the epitome of my stupidity and it paid off. So I came in ICO price, that was 0 0.12. Then it went up instantly to like $2. And I'm like, yo, I'm a genius. I'm absolutely killing this. I went in heavier, like doubled my already ridiculous amount in there. Then it went up to four, it went up to six. And I'm like, okay, time to cash out. I did it. Went up to eight, I cashed out a third. Went up to 10, I cashed out a third. I had a plan to cash out the last third, which this was an immense amount of money at 12. So while I t profited, I've still got a lot of money on the table, which I should be taking out. As soon as I got to 12, I'm like, you know what? You know, I'm gonna wait till 15. <laughs> like, if I wait till 15, I can do stupid thing I want just for fun. And I didn't cash out there. I was like, nope, I'm sticking to 15. Bear in mind, I've got my sensible portfolio doing well. I should have been just funneling out into that, doing it sensibly. But yeah, so that that's now worth like 34 cents. And I just kind of left that in there because I was so infuriated that I didn't get it out of 12. And um, because I'd already made money on it, I just, that one was just a, okay, I am just being stubborn. I'm being stupid uh, until ICX goes to 15. And if it never does again, that bag's just gonna stay there and rot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I, they, this stuff can. My stupidity paid off in the run. It will probably never do again in any instance. And for anyone going for a long-term thing, I don't even know how we got onto this topic right now. But yeah, if you're doing it over a long period of time, over a long sample size, you will lose. You will lose hard. Um, oh. But yeah, sometimes it pays off if you're really lucky. No, I, I had the same thing happen. I was, uh, oh yeah, uh, I, I had like a lot of friends in Bangkok who were who made so much money off ICOs in 2017. <laughs> you know, even 2016, yeah. they were starting to do it. So then I got a little bit into it, but at at the wrong time. Um, so like every ICO that I was getting into around, this must have been around August or something. Nothing was making any money because yeah. Bitcoin was soaring really high, and so everything was just down. <laughs> Um, and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? So then I stopped what getting into get in? ICOs. Sorry? Mm. What did you get into? I'm curious to see if we looked at any of the same things. I got into Storm. I got into, um, yeah. what else did I get into? Fuck, I don't remember. I got into Storm did okay, didn't it? Mothership. Mothership. Oh my God, that didn't turn out well either. No I got into... Is. I got in some Everex that I just cashed out at break even because at that point I was just losing on everything. So I was <laughs> like, fuck this, I'm just cashing out. And and then what happens is then I'm like, fuck ICOs. 
two months later, my friend has made like fucking, you know, over a million dollars on ICX. I'm like, fuck my oh, life. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, so, I yeah, can't I, win. I can't win on these ICOs. Uh, so then I got, so I was like, fuck this. I'm getting back into the ICO game. So then I got into. Wait, did uh, you bring cash out with his ICX though? No, he didn't. That's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, I think. Uh, Wait, sat down a million? Like, no, 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 no. He did cash. Million. Yeah, he did cash some out. So he's definitely, I mean, he's hurting, but but he's uh, in the sense that where the top was. So he's he's come down yeah. a lot, but I think he he did actually cash out a bunch uh, above six k. I think when he um, uh, when he kind of thought that it was kind of stabilizing. Um, but then I got back into the ICO game in uh, around January February. I was like, okay, I'm getting yeah. back in, you know. And those things didn't work out either, right? Because after that, everything was just going down. So I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna go oh, do after trading. ICX. Second. So, so after, I, after ICX, I did any luck reserve I had is now out. I am now done with easy money luck. I, I, I'm convinced I will never make money that quickly and easily ever again in my life, and I'm happy with that. But I'm out of luck. I'm not touching ICOs <laughs> again because any luck I have has been used. Um, and my next ICO will not only go badly or probably send me to jail because it was involved in something really bad. I'm yeah. out of luck. ICOs, like I'm done with that. <laughs> No man, these ICOs, I mean, it's also just kind of crazy with how this ICO thing works because you got, I mean, people. We are so greedy that we are giving money. So we are crowdfunding these people have no working product, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing to show us. We're just giving them money in the hope of getting rich oh, ourselves. Wow. And at the same time, we're pretty much getting. They're making money off, you know, all the donations, right? It's it's just insane. Yeah. It's really insane. So, 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 yeah, donations. I love that you said donations because it, a lot of ICOs, a lot of ICOs were the literal equivalent of me saying, hey, I want you to invest in me, Grush. Someday I'm going to be worth something and I have some vague ideas of how I'm going to do this. This <laughs> copy and paste of white paper, which I got $5 on Fiverr. Uh, and what I'm going to give you in return, now this is really great, is it's going to be a piece of paper. And on it, I'm going to write Karush dollars. And you can give it to other people and they'll give you more money for it, but you can buy it for me for the cheapest and sell it more expensively. That, that's what the ICOs were. Uh, you were giving Karush dollars the equivalent of that and millions. Oh my God. Um, how much, do you know how much the whole ICO market made? Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was, yeah, it was definitely in the billions. Like, it was it, definitely it in the billions. The billions yeah. Um, but ridiculous amounts of money, irrational exuberance at its peak. That was the great, like, has there ever been that much accumulation of human wealth in history? Like, I, I, I've i never seen anything like that happen before. It was, yeah, it was insane. It was insane. I mean, the irony, the irony really is, it's so ironic that we talk about wealth distribution and how blockchain and Bitcoin is going to give money back to uh, the people and shit like that. And then in the mm -hmm. end, all the charlatans, all those people who are smarter than us, they come in and they're like, "Yeah, come on, you wealth distribution, come on, just you know, <laughs> accept this way." And we're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, give us wealth to distribute." <laughs> but I, I do really feel, you know, uh, that, that's why I, I one thing when it comes to the crypto space, I I wish that uh, I talked about this in the last couple of episodes as well that. We need to be more uh, better at policing ourselves. Um, I was having my last one with iDraw Charts, uh, David. He was saying that as a community, because we don't have any regulation, we really should be much more proactive and uh, diligent about calling out scams and protecting each other in the community and stuff like that. And yeah, I really think there's no other choice at this point, right? And that's why we, we should be doing these kind of informative things like podcasts and and criticism openly and call for more transparency there's so much shilling going on on twitter as well which is fine you know okay. people need to make a buck but i think if we just call it out as we see it it's probably much better for the layman because if they get if they get hurt they lose all their money you know it's just that mm -hmm. can't be good for the space they can't be good for adoption they can't be good for i mean then we're just going to get over regulated at some point probably 
Well, I don't know. Oh, oh, regulation has to come in. Overregulation will come in once enough people have been hurt, once the wounds are deep enough. And yes, absolutely, there's an obligation to at least do your part in putting out good information. I mean, I hope anyone who's seen this podcast uh, who watches this will take away from it. Um, control your emotions, maybe go meditate, put together a system, a proper trading system where you following signals and you've actually seen it works, you have results, don't understand investing before you get into this, actually know how managing your money works. This is information which really needs to be available to the masses. Honestly, it's not, it's very easy for a lot of people to, um, now I hate when I see, see, see this, where people are like, oh, if you follow that person shilling this coin, you deserve to have lost your money. That, that is the least empathetic, most yeah. ignorant thing someone could possibly say. You don't know how desperate that person was. You don't know how much that person needed this opportunity and what led him to do that. You would have probably done the exact same thing he did in his situation. So be empathetic, understand this, and do your part. For me, what I do is I put out good information and I try to put out a positive energy, energy and a good mindset. That's essential to me. Um, I personally don't really go out calling scams because uh, it just goes against my energy. I don't like being like, oh, you're a piece of shit. You're an awful person and insult that person or attack that person, what they're doing. I kind of hope if enough good information gets out there, the bad will be fizzled out or isolated to their corners. And mm. my God, there's a lot of bad there. And I could entirely rework my channel just calling out bad things. But yeah, my, my approach to that is positive energy, good mindset and educational content uh simple stuff like no one's gonna go wrong with build your own system don't follow follow signals like i think that's a pretty for sure should be giving out so i mean you know uh, talking to you more of course i feel like you you definitely definitely try and take care of yourself it seems like to me that you really try and focus on making sure that you're in the right mindset as well and i really haven't spoken that much about mindset when it comes to trading in the past podcasts as much i mean i have a little oh, really? bit but it really is the is, is like truly the most important aspect, especially because if we're encouraging people to learn their own systems and learn about mm -hmm. trading and learn about markets, at that point, the mindset really truly becomes the one thing they must try and master. And it's going to be a lifetime of trying to, you know, mastering that mindset. But mm -hmm. it, it really is the only way to do it. And you're saying meditation is, is one of the ways to go for sure. Um, there's multiple way, ways of developing awareness. That's the route I've chosen. You can research and, and ways which will work for you. Uh, I haven't needed to research any others because that's what works for me. And think about this. If you're planning on trading for a long period of time, say 40 years, uh, most traders I know, the good ones, they if, if they did study, they'll spend like up to two years before they have a profit system themselves. Uh, some of them will spend less time, they, like hire someone who can teach them the basics. So they'll pay for that time. So you pay some money, you save some, you get the flow faster. But regardless of your choice, that'll be say four months to two years. That's the period most people will get their system together, have their basic psychological stuff sorted, and be ready to start trading with consistent profit. Now, if you want to do this over a long period of time say 40 years, well, that's two years done. That's everything done. You've made a system. You can make more systems, but really one good system is all you need and the ability to adapt that to different market conditions. After that, it's just mindset. You just got to constantly take care of yourself, make sure you don't do stupid things, take stupid risks. And that's the secret to longevity in the game. A lot of people, their goal is to be able to travel the world, just trade off their laptop or um, live in Thailand and make a sick living because they can um, make money off trading and to do that you've got to keep that up and that's the most difficult part not everyone is capable of doing that but uh, i truly believe if people put in effort to learning a system they put in the effort to maintaining their mindset they can somewhat replicate their real income and there's huge fluctuations here but generally if we assume a correlation between intelligence intu intuition and income then you could probably replicate what you're currently earning in trading after X years of practice and data behind it. So yeah, some people that will be like 20K a year they can make off trading. Other people who um, would have made like 100K in their job probably have higher intelligence intuition. Loads of exceptions to this, absolutely loads, but 
I think we can generally agree that correlation there. They'll probably be earning something like 100K or higher from trading. I mean, in a lot of ways, something just occurred to me as well is that, you know how we've gone from, from the last 40 years, uh, sport and exercise has become a, a part of our life where you, we talk about how, you know, if you want to be in shape or you want to keep in shape, uh, exercise is supposed to be a, a way of life. And yeah. in a lot of ways, it seems to me that if we also make finance a way of life, that we have money, this is our resources. How do we handle this resource, these resources that we have, this amount of cash or uh, capital that I have coming in every month, my salary, and learn to use that in the most efficient way possible is truly, if we think of that as another aspect and facet of our life. So we have one which is focuses on the, the, the physical and then uh, the mental, you know, you have, you take care of yourself, you, you yep. stay around positive people, you have a good support system with your friends, um, you don't, um, stuff like that. And then the next thing that we do need to survive as well is our finances. And we really don't think of that in today's day and age really about how that should be mm -hmm. one of the facets that we should also have as a, where we, you know, get better at it and get better at managing our money and get better at investing it, et cetera. Well, I love that this is where you've gone with this because um, I've been thinking this for a long time and it wasn't until I got out uh, like onto Twitter. Uh, the reason I came onto Twitter was actually because I finally felt I perfected my, not perfected, um, I'd gotten to a point a lot of people really want to get to with their trading and because I had this knowledge, I could share it because I also understood business and investing and all the stuff you're talking about, about wealth management is like a skill, like how, like just a knowledge, a basic thing, which they should be teaching you in school from a very young age. This is the one thing that we I value, know. one of the few things that we value the most, right? So we got to, we, yeah. why don't we hone this skill? Um, so, so absolutely. I don't see, I love the fact that we teach biology and maths and English. And I think there's immense value in all of these. A lot of people will, um, knock on these, but up the wealth and tax management. And I completely disagree with that. Um, I feel we need to giving people an understanding of the world and what we know about the world is essential. And we don't want to just throw them into our current mold of society. So future generations can prove on society, but the basics of wealth management to maintain at least a certain level of security is essential and it's so important but now this is going in a little bit into conspiracy theory but i don't think the government wants to do that i don't think any government sees that in their interest they want to have their workforce they want to have spending money so there's economic activity they don't really want everyone saving and investing and um, being sensible with their money uh, again it's horrible to say but that's the way it is and one of the big, so I mentioned a few times, um, I actually, trading is not my main source of income. I run a few businesses and I love starting new ones. One main thing I'm going into huge is I'm working with a lot of traders and entrepreneurs to launch something which can hopefully do something about this issue. And it's one I really hold close to heart because a lot of people really don't have that empathy, which we were talking about earlier. You need to understand how people, other people who aren't in the same position as you who didn't have say your parents or who haven't looked into trading and investing like you they are just desperate and ignorant and they will give in to whatever they see these scams these mistakes they'll make them because they're desperate or ignorant or both and you need to be empathetic that if you were in the same place you would do the same thing instead of being judgmental do something about that mm -hmm. uh yeah no, it is. Um, it is true, and and especially these days, uh, this is a world where I feel like sometimes there's a lot of uh, lack of empathy. You know, with the politics these days, and uh, well, you know that you're following. Um, I'm sure you follow world events. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, it's not politics aren't of huge interest to me. I tend to focus a lot more on myself, even like the whole Brexit situation, which obviously is the biggest thing happening right now for me, I couldn't care less. What about is going it. on with Brexit now? Anyways, what is going on with it? it got delayed in some or something, right? 
So I'm the worst person to ask about this. <laughs> Absolutely. Basically, um, I even on the day of the vote, I didn't even care. I was like, whatever, something's going to happen. It's not really going to change my life that much at all. Um, if there's a change in like risk with regards to investments, my long term investments are mostly passive. So I don't really care about that. Um, if there's a change in law, I'll adapt to it. But everyone else who's in my competition in regards to business will suffer the same things. Uh, there's never going to be an issue with traveling. At worst, I'll have to get spend like a day getting an extra visa. So I don't really care. A lot of people will get crazy, like go crazy over this. But at the end of the day, if there's no actual strong effect to me, my loved ones, and my ability to operate and help them, it's not really going to make a big difference. And as long as the country as a whole really hasn't Yes, they could suffer from the decision, but then there's a huge amount of arguments which people like to overlook on the other side. And unless you are specialized in the field, unless you looked hugely at the economic data available and you're an expert, you really shouldn't have super hard opinions. This is one thing I'm huge on, having a bipolar mindset. And um, I, by this, I don't mean having bipolar disorder. I mean, being able to see the duality in things. Um, there is no absolute right. There's seldom an absolute long, wrong. And have the humility to know when you aren't educated enough to talk about a subject. So you asked me about Brexit right now. And what I did, instead of giving a super strong opinion, I told you the truth. I have the humility to know that this isn't something I'm hugely knowledgeable about. And there are people who are way more knowledgeable about than me. So any opinion I have will be either anecdotal or not of sufficient strength to actually hold weight. So I'll have a loud voice. I could have a loud voice, but it's not going to mean anything. I'll I'd rather listen to the more intelligent voices, form an opinion, and until that, fo until then, focus on the things that I'm actually knowledgeable about. That, sure, yeah, that's sure. That's why brings it. No, no, I, I, I agree also. In, in a lot of ways, sometimes it's also uh, wasteful to spend energy on stuff that is uh, really hard for us to control as well. Although I do hope that I don't get too restricted with traveling because I, I actually have a British passport as well. I was born in yeah. England. So uh, I don't want to get screwed too hard if I'm going to go back to Europe or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I don't think you will at all, honestly. Um, at worst, you'll need like a visa. That's it. Yeah, um, I don't think so either. I don't think so either. Uh, I, I wanted to... Yeah, please. No, I wanted to ask you about something, but now I freaking forgot what it was. Um, <laughs> when you were talking about Brexit, what was it? It was about... Um... Well, never mind. I forgot. People, no, no, no. Yeah. What I was wanted to ask you was mindset. you said you have you have some investments um and you you yep. uh, what I wanted to ask you was about what are your thoughts about the traditional markets these days? Because it looks like um you know the the stock market is kind of wobbly right now and uh, oh, yeah. you do you, you also trade the stock market, right? Um no, so I don't trade the stock market. I do trade forex, but generally I most of my systems, uh, like they can be implemented in stock market, but they work much better in Forex and crypto. So I have no reason to be trading the stock market right now. But I do have long term investments in the stock market because I mean, you'd be foolish not to, if you're managing wealth, even have like at least have some sort of exposure to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so my thoughts with regards to that is that we are currently in the biggest bull run ever. And there's no telling how high this is going to go. So you need to have exposure to it. Now, how you have that exposure is up to you. I personally have it passively by just dollar cost averaging every single month into a very broad fund. So that's how I'm comfortable having my long term exposure to it. But you absolutely need to be prepared for an extreme downturn, not just in the stock market, but the economy as a whole. So if you are especially if you're an entrepreneur right now, or you are a trader, you need to be ready for this downturn. Now, traders often think that, oh, if there's a huge downturn, I can just short. Another thing which tends to go away hugely is volume. And without volume, there's a lot less opportunity. So even as traders will be earning less money during that period. So I'm sure a lot of people have noticed with Bitcoin, for example, let's use that as a um, case study here. Earlier this year, I was in almost as much money as I was during the bull run because there was an immense amount of volume to short and trade um, as the, it was going down. But the further down we've gone, the more volume has been sucked out of the market. And if no one's trading, there's not that much money to be made. 
Same thing can be happened if you just visualize a similar thing with the economy. As everything starts to go away, as the money gets sucked out, there's less money going around, less money to be traded, less money to be made. So absolutely be prepared for something like that. Uh, have your backup plan. And if you're an overexposed entrepreneur, have some serious thoughts about diversifying your income and just be ready for the worst. It's going to happen. Nothing goes up forever. Um, I can say that with absolute certainty. And when it does, be prepared for it. Well, I was I was looking at um, the Dow Jones Industrial as well, and um, you know, obviously, there's always uh, exceptions to the rule, but it was showing a massive uh, bearish divergence on. Well, it must have been the weekly chart, and I look back, mm -hmm. uh, and I think I saw something, saw something on Twitter too, which is why I double checked it. That apparently, back all the way back to 1958. Um, I think 66% of the time there's been a, uh, a, bear, a bear divergence on the RSI on the weekly. The market has gone down about 40%. The other times... Oh, wow. Yeah, the other times, uh, the other 33 times, the market just did a correction of 14%, 50%. Uh, so it's going to be interesting mm -hmm. to see what happens this time around. And But yeah, obviously, if there's like a big crash, it won't be good. Say again? Well, let's talk about data right now because um, that's a really awesome statistic and you hear a lot of awesome statistics like that for sure. Um, one thing to definitely bear in mind is, well, when it, stock market is entirely different, but when it comes to Bitcoin, people like to quote things that have happened before on an extremely small sample size of data. Um, do you know how many instances of this divergence there was for that 66%? Because 66% of, say, um, 20 times is a very different to 66%. This was small. This was small. This was like, yeah, I mean, this 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 must have been. It was on the weekly chart, so maybe it's like yeah. 10, 11, 12 times or something? 10, 11, 12. Okay, so again, it's useful data. It should definitely be taken note of, but I personally wouldn't make heavy decisions on that due to the small sample size and how much just imagine there's a very so uh, do you know how variance works for sure no i totally understand what you're okay. what you're saying so obviously the sample size is very yeah. small yeah so anyone who's listening just variance is a huge thing and this is why sample size is important because if you have 10 trades and there's a split of say 70 percent of an event happening uh you could get vastly results from 10 trades and those, that range of difference is variance. So that's variance on a basic level. And then if you take that up to 100, the range of difference shortens because the majority will be in the high probability zone. You make it 1,000, the majority get over there. So yeah, anyone who doesn't know what variance is, now you do. That's why I love having 100 trades to show something. I don't value 20 trades or even 50 trades that much. Right, right, right. No, it makes a lot of sense. And it's actually, I'm really glad you brought it up because I really actually had not really thought of that myself. Uh, but yeah, 12 is nothing for a sample size. So we have no idea what actually is going to happen. <laughs> it's like a, um, say it's a 30, 70% chance. If you look at the probability, there is say a 10% probability that um, all of those could have been the low probability events happening. And that's still one out of 10 times. I wouldn't take massive risks on that. Right, right, right. So what other stuff do you do? You said you're starting up uh, some other businesses and stuff. You know, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if we take like a step back to how I got into all this, uh, I studied maths at university and um, I was right on track to going on just working at a bank, being a trader there. So that was actually what I was going for. It's just working sales and trading at a bank. And why? Because I was extremely different back then. I mean, if the me then saw the me now talking about mindset and positivity and stuff like that, he'd be like, who the hell is this guy? How old are you? Uh, I had a, a me, I guess. I would say you are, I mean, you, you look young. You got the beard, you're rocking okay. the beard, but you, you look young. So I would say 20, <laughs> 27. Close. That's, that's actually the usual guess I get. I'm actually 25. Right, right. Well, that doesn't surprise me either. Yeah. The beard, the beard so, threw me off. <laughs> that, everyone does. The, so um, the beard takes off a few years. Uh, no, adds quite a few years. But yeah, so I was at university, say, now it's quite a while ago. Seven years ago, I started university. By the way, your where, webcam is super blurry right now. Oh, there you go. It's, it's bad. Is it? Yeah. Is it I was bad? Wondering. Oh, also, it's probably because I maybe 
moved too quickly or something like that. <laughs> it's fine now. It's fine. Lost both. Awesome. Um, but yeah, so uh, when I was at 18, obviously, I go to university, I was studying maths, and I was right on track to going into a bank and just going into sales and trading. Why? Money. That's That was the only reason. Um, I didn't really... I, I had a huge ego, and I had not develop my worldview hugely. I feel a lot of people do while they're at university and beyond. And what happened in second year of university he was a, a good friend of mine uh, came up to me and he's like, yo, dude, you're smart. I need a partner. I've got an awesome idea. Do you want to join? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds like money. Let's do it. And we started an import company where we were bringing in kitchenware from, what was it, uh, Germany and distributing it across northern England. And the reason this was working really well was because back then when we were doing it, the euro was extremely uh, weak against the pound. So we were buying really cheap and we had um, a very good deal with our supplier. And if you ever see, if you ever go around and you see like corner shops, which sell a whole bunch of kitchenware and different stuff like that, and you wonder where they got it from, they, they get it from guys like us. And we could give it cheaper to every single person, like substantially cheaper and we our profit margins were about 10 percent which is is our uh sort of like wholesale of kitchenware it's, it was uh like unheard of our prices were that good and it, it grew and my first business did really well so two gentlemen of luck i feel for sure but it worked out and i just i was very passionate about it i enjoyed it uh, i did a lot of stupid things so back then i had a massive ego and um i lost one time, so I lost a huge business deal because I was too stubborn to work with someone because he, he was respecting me, and for some reason that was more important to me than the actual business. And a lot of personal development happened after that, where I realized mistakes I'd made, and I got into reading, self development, improving um, myself where however I can, and eventually went on the path to getting over here through multiple businesses lots of them failed some of them worked the ones that worked made it all worth it and i've just been doing that pretty much since i graduated university yeah well, how many businesses did you go through because the one thing that oh, i God. kind of have a fear about businesses is that i always think to myself that it's going to take certain attempts to have a successful business and that's one of the mental blocks that i sometimes have where i'm thinking oh you know how many tries it is is it going to take and you know starting a business is not like you know putting up a trade or playing a poker hand you know yeah. you can play a lot of poker hands in one day you can put you can you can do a lot of trading over the course of a year but you don't start you know 10 businesses over the course of a year do you absolutely so with that um the, the, there's two types of businesses and uh, people are kind of confused. So there's one which is kind of how I see as a money making operation where you notice a gap in the market. For example, that you could buy something cheap and sell it to someone cheaper or you notice a loophole. So, for example, and this was one of my successful businesses, I started a property salvaging company where I noticed that a lot of there was a there was a law change in London where everyone was changing their non-residential property to residential property because we needed more residential property in London and there was huge tax benefits and I think subsidies as well. But basically there was a huge monetary incentive to change these and completely renovate them. So a lot of people were knocking down a lot of stuff and making huge structural changes. When you make these structural changes, you have a lot of debris which you need to get rid of. And what they normally did is because these are such wealthy people doing such big projects is they'll pay five grand to have a skip come and pick up the stuff and just send it to a dump. And what I knew was that this debris is extremely valuable. Like uh, some of them were extremely old buildings with certain types of oak, which you can't really get easily anymore. And if I could just, I could find someone who's looking for this debris to come and pick up their rubbish for free and pay me for their rubbish and business, which went on for us. So a business- How did you get the inspiration like a, for that idea? I mean, you know, that's kind so, of interesting. Um, yeah, I love that you asked that. So I have a philosophy with being able to find these opportunities. Uh, the inspiration for that idea was I was actually at a construction site because I was looking to buy and rent out property. So just a simple operation, standard thing. So I was going to these construction sites, these newly developing ones that um, give good deals to early investors coming in. And I just noticed that as I was downstairs, someone was showing me this massive 
wooden, like this massive wooden pillar. Normally where you'd see a me metal one, this was like this very old rare oak, which I don't think you can even get anymore because uh, there's like, they're protected. Uh, but yeah, and he's like, yeah, this is really old. This is super um, antique. And I'm like, I just hear old and antique and my brain, like dollar signs are going off in my brain. I'm like, that sounds expensive. Um, and he's like, so what, do you, what are you going to do with that? And he said, oh, we just got to skip to pick it up and throw it away. And that's how the idea started. So um, mm. generally, if you do want to get into entrepreneurial stuff and business like this, there's two things you need. Um, one, the awareness to understand your weaknesses and continually work on them and improve on them. And two, you need to, when you see an opportunity, because you've been improving yourself and you're at a place to take advantage of it, immediately take it advantage of it, ready for it to fail. And the thing I do with being ready for the failure is I make sure no matter what, I come out with a skill. So for example, when I went into building trading box, I knew that was going to be a big time investment and a tangent from my trading, but I made sure that even if it didn't work out, I would come out with some knowledge of Python, some more knowledge of how the bot market works in general. And so even if I lose, I win. And that's the key. You've got to make the losses wins, even if they don't work out. So that could be connections, that could be um, new skills, like tangible skills or new personal skills, like um, social skills and stuff like that. No, no, for sure. For sure. I mean, uh, that's really what failure always is. Failure is always really just learning, learning stuff. And that's why I always kind of try and stress to myself as well. I'd rather try and try and do stuff because when you do stuff, you learn way more, I feel like, than mm -hmm. when you're like reading some kind of tutorial about why and what to do, et cetera. Whereas when you do something and you go through the obstacles that you go through, mm -hmm. you learn, oh, like you can't do that. And it's just imprinted in your brain for, you know, future endeavors or whatever that would be. Hugely. People go um, through this phase of like, um, they, they, they suddenly read a book and they're like, whoa, this is super good stuff. This is teaching me about human psychology. I now can read people like I'm a detector and they love that. They feel good. And they go onto another book and they're like, oh, now I can um, invest and uh, make millions. And then they go onto another book. And this is uh, mental masturbation. You feel good because you're learning stuff, but you're not actually applying it. I read a book uh, for a uh, when I was starting off my Twitter, I was reading uh, Gary Vee's book. I'm a huge Gary Vee fan. I love his energy, his mindset, and what he does. Um, and he, his book was all about building a brand on social media. And this book took me ages to read. Why? Because I'd start reading it. I'd get like 10 pages in. I'd have an, I'd have an idea I wanted to apply. And I went straight onto like Twitter, made some notes, started um, putting together a system to put the stuff up. And... That's the way you should read any book. Uh, read through it. You get something good. Make a note of it. Make sure you apply it every single day. Uh, like if you go off after this interview and you're interested in the mind illuminated and you want to read it, just have a journal next to it. Um, if you read stage one, it's like start meditating every day. Set an alarm every day to start meditating. At, um, like the first thing you make, wake up or whatever you works for you. Make sure you apply what you learn or again, you're just, it's just mental masturbation. No, 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 I totally agree, man, because I really feel like if I was going to put a number on it, I would say when it comes to trying to educate yourself about something, because it's always good to educate yourself, right? Like before you start anything, mm -hmm. whether whatever it is, um, you want to educate yourself a little bit so you have a better head start than if you just had to trial and error from the very beginning. So but it's got to be it's got to be in the single digits how much you should be educating yourself versus actively doing stuff, which and I'm including in actively doing stuff. I'm including studying uh, in the sense like, for example, in trading, you're doing studying, you're, you're studying trading. That's, you know, that's still working. Right. But reading about trading, I wouldn't do that more than I don't yeah, know. testing your system. That is um, definitely actually trading paper trading. That is actually trading. But reading a whole bunch of strategies like reading a book on price action, then reading a book on classical charting, then reading a book on Elliott Wave, and just going through these, that's completely useless. That's not going to do anything for you at all. Um, what you want to do with it is have a plan, have an actionable plan when you're reading. So you mentioned a single digit percentage. How I would describe it is before going into a new venture, I always start about 50-50. So 50% study, 50% application. And then I slowly up the application and reduce the reading. And then I'll flat, I'll like flat it down at about 10%. I always think you need to maintain that 10% so you're right, continually right. improving. 
because pure application is also an error a lot of people get into and um, a mistake a lot of people make. When you're just applying and you're not improving, uh, for example, in business, you're going to let your competition get ahead of you. In trading, uh, market conditions are going to change and you're not going to be ready for for it or your systems just stay stagnant and you lose motivation uh, always good to maintain that level of learning always but application should always be like not always application should definitely be 90 percent of what you're doing because knowledge is useless when not applied and in fact the knowledge disappears like you, you're not going to remember everything was in three books you just read and didn't know uh, to actually remember something uh Performing the action helps hugely. So with memory, you have um, visual, audio, and physical, and then you've got emotional. So uh, you can get visual, audio, and um, physical. By physical, I mean like actually doing it by reading or practicing. But when you're actually applying it and it's part of your lifestyle, that's when the emotional stuff comes in. And when you have like emotions attached to certain instances, that gets ingrained in there. That's when you start developing the instincts and intuition that's what you want to be striving for for sure man for sure i uh i'm glad i'm agreeing with you all these things that means i'm not <laughs> totally i'm not totally stupid then you know because you seem <laughs> dude, like a very dude, uh, smart person <laughs> I, I really appreciate that i'm not i'm really not i'm just um, i feel like your I'm head should be bigger it's not big enough there's like too much uh, <laughs> dude um i i, I don't uh, yeah compliments i'm weak to them but uh i'm not <laughs> Um, uh, you have a YouTube channel as well, right? Where you, uh, I was checking out your YouTube channel earlier. There's a lot of uh, beginner stuff there, but you're not going to get into some advanced stuff on that? Uh, so the problem with advanced stuff is even in my Twitter, you'll notice as time's gone on, I've simplified it hugely. Uh, people tend to make more mistakes when I talk about advanced stuff. Uh, whenever uh, I don't talk about Elliott Wave at all anymore. Because as soon as I bring complexity in, there's a whole bunch of questions. People tend to lose money more than they make it. So I like to keep it as simple as possible. You can make a pretty effective system just out of support and resistance. Uh, I'll throw some hints and tips in with my uh, Twitter and my YouTube. But generally, just know how to identify coins, make a basic system together. And that's it. That's all you need. You don't need to learn uh, like like my, like huge Elliott wave patterns with super microstructures um, within them and break them down and study it back since like the start of the dip. You don't need to do that. Just isolate something, make a system out of it, and consistency consist consistently apply it again and again. No, no, for sure, man. And it's actually kind of uh, funny. I was thinking about this today. How how um, trading in itself, the theoretical part of trading in itself, is very, very easy. Uh, mm -hmm. But the execution is really where it gets tricky. Um, absolutely. The, so that, that's, that goes into what we've been talking about this whole time, the mindset versus the actual having a strategy. So that's two years of it. And the 38 years you have left over of your trading career, that's all about the execution, making sure your brain stays in check. And also there's the risk management element, which is uh, not taught too well with regards to the actual trading strategies. And yeah, there's, there's a difference between trading and charting. There's a lot of people, um, again, I told you, I don't like saying anything negative, but um, this is as close to negative as I'll get. Um, I would say they can't actually trade, and that puts a lot of misinformation out there and makes people think they can trade and causes a lot of losses in the market. So if someone's drawing pretty, pretty charts, that doesn't mean they can trade, and don't be fooled by that. Make sure you see some evidence of actual trading, maybe some real-time trades, some live trades, um, a show that they know that this is just the chart, tells like that that they are actual traders and not just um, chartists, yeah. Right, right. No, for sure. I mean, there's definitely uh, the one thing that people need to be aware of is obviously, you know, a lot of people are out there um, trying to also sell sell stuff to them and uh, then they you know yeah. they try and do ta and but usually you know if someone is admitting that they're wrong a lot you know and they're like um you can just kind of tell but it takes some time it took me some time to figure out who was actually good who was not and who was just okay. kind of a little bit of a show even as a pretty good trader i noticed a lot of people i used to look up to that i thought were really awesome and they were really good people because well 
the worst is the people that not only are pretending to trade, but they also pretend to be really good people and really nice and out there to help you when behind the scenes they're charging you huge amounts of money and all their income comes from pretending to look yeah. good. <laughs> the, the marketing can be fantastic. And I, I've been fooled by quite a few people. I'm sure I'm like, I'm sure some people who I think right now are really good are probably not. So the thing is just assume, I hate the world view of assuming the worst because it's, it's not nice. It's not nice to meet someone and immediately not trust them. Personally, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, even if it hurts me because it makes me happier and it makes me enjoy, it makes me view the world in a nicer way. But when it comes to Twitter, when it comes to trading, you can definitely go in with doubt someone initially, uh, me, including me, including me, doubt me, look into me, look into what I put up, look into how I put it up, go through my stuff before you start listening to me, make sure I am who I say I am. And yeah, so I'm not just saying do it with other people, don't do it with me, do it with me as well. I have nothing to hide. You can go and look at what I put up, how I put it up. And not everyone can say that. A lot of people delete tweets and um, they said some really stupid stuff a long time ago and you can't find it anymore. All you can see is wet vague screenshots. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just be careful when it comes to that, absolutely. Um, I went on a tangent, so I forgot the initial question, but I think I said quite a bit on that. No, no, I think I forgot the initial question as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's great to, that you came on here, and um, you know, I think uh, you should definitely come on some more and talk some more. I, I think I people. Really this is this is probably one of the best uh, episodes we've had, where I think people are going to learn a ton, especially about mindset, sample size, and really what data is about. We should definitely talk I'm about this. I really hope it's helpful to some people, or at least they found it funny if they thought it was silly. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 it's all good. Plus, you got a beard. You know, we're two guys with beards, so this is a Beards high quality do podcast. directly correlate with wisdom, and That's what uh, I think. especially when it comes to podcasts. That's why we. This was the only camera episode because we had two people with beards on. Uh, without a beard, there won't be a camera element. For now. <laughs> awesome. Well, listen. Thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, I'll stop the podcast, but you don't have to hang up right away, and uh, yeah. we can chat for a little bit. But guys, thanks so much for uh, tuning in. I hope it was very informative and um, you know, remember to follow Kurosh on uh, Twitter. I have put the links down in the description and check out his YouTube channel. He's got a lot of good stuff, uh, tutorials and stuff like that uh, on there. So yeah, thanks for tuning in guys.